It is good to see everyone this morning. We're thankful that each of you had a heart to turn out, come to the house of God where we may worship the Lord our God. Appreciate the singing, the prayers that have been offered. I ask a continued interest in your prayers this morning that the Lord would send his spirit in a mighty way that we might preach the sweet gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Last Sunday we endeavored to speak concerning the subject of living by faith. We found two applications of that phrase in the Galatian letter, where we found that to live by faith means that we have been necessarily made alive by the Spirit of God, the faith of God being placed in us, we now have spiritual life, so we live by faith. The other meaning of living by faith is to live in dependence upon God, depending upon him, relying upon him, uh, to be our God, our keeper, our friend, our savior, our grace to help in time of need. This morning, I would like to continue with the subject of faith, but I would like to deal this morning with the subject of the faithfulness of our God the faithfulness of our God. <clears throat> Faith is one of those subjects that every religion must have. You must have faith. Because in every religion, you're called upon to believe things that you did not witness, that you cannot materially prove. You're called upon to believe things that have not occurred yet. You're called upon to believe in a God that you have not seen with your natural eyes. So faith is absolutely necessary in religion. One of the amazing things about faith is that you cannot believe in faith unless you have faith. You cannot believe the word of God to be the true word of God unless you have faith. You cannot obtain faith yourself. It is that which is endowed or authored within every child of God sometime between conception and death. With respect to our God, Faith has two meanings. One, it has to do with divine fidelity or reliability. It is closely related to the word true. Sometimes when a minister is conducting a wedding ceremony, he will ask the, the husband and the bride if they will be true to each other. What he's asking is, will you be totally faithful to each other, committed to each other and each other only? The word faith has that same connotation to it. As a matter of fact, in some cases, is even translated to the word truth in the Bible. The word faith in similar words appears about 1,006 times in the Bible. I counted them myself. I know that they are there, and I have them listed separately. This morning, I would like to speak, if the Lord be pleased, concerning that faith that God has, that truth that God has, the reliability of God. You can count upon God. There's not many things in this life that we can count upon but we can surely count upon our God. If you would turn back with me, just briefly, I want you to make note that in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses gives a second recording of the Ten Commandments. All ten of them are listed here. There's two places in the Bible that the Ten Commandments are listed uh, um, in order 
and consecutively. That's in Exodus chapter 20 and um, in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now, in chapter 6, the message of chapter 6 is Moses is exhorting the children of God to hear God and keep his commandments under the threat of the punitive hand of God. All right? Chapter 7, Moses warns the children of Israel about their associations with pagan people, ungodly people. Then in chapter 7, and verse number 6, Moses begins to address Israel this way. He says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. So notice, notice the relationship that God has chosen to have with his people. He says, thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. They were holy unto God because God had made them so. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, the choosing of Israel and God's special blessings toward them uh, were reflective and they prophesied of the coming of the church of Jesus Christ. This same characterization applies to us this morning, the children of God today in the church, a holy people unto the Lord, chosen people, special people, and a people that God has rendered uh, unto himself in a state that they're above all people, to especially bless. Verse number seven, he says, The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, now listen to this, because the Lord loved you, you ever stop and consider that the God who commanded the world into existence, the God who has the power to raise the dead to life, has chosen to love you. This is a durable love that we'll see in a, in a little while. This is a love that will not fail. This is love, the love that the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 2 and 4. He says it is a great love wherewith he hath loved us. Because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath, in verse number 8, which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now therefore, after he explains that our God has loved us and has done so much for us, he says, now therefore... Uh, he says, know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. Now, when he says, know therefore, that means stop and consider. It is necessary that we often stop and consider our God. He has considered us. He has chosen us. He has chosen to love us, to give his life for us. He is worthy of our often consideration, is he not? He says, now, he says, know therefore that the Lord thy God, while he is God, that is, in contrast to all the others that are not gods, those who present themselves and profess themselves uh, to be gods. He says, they're not gods, but your God is God. Now listen what else he says. He says, <clears throat> This God that is God, he's the faithful God. Now, when we, if we refer to someone as being faithful, that means you can count upon them. Uh, when the going gets rough, a faithful person will support the person that's having a rough time. But we human beings, every one of us fail, do we not? But Moses is making the, the point that the God that chose you 
He is faithful. So when you say that God is faithful, there's no, there's no need to qualify it by saying he's perfectly faithful. There's no need to qualify it by saying he, uh, he's faithful uh, because he's God. It is a simply uh, most adequate statement to say God is faithful. That means what God has promised, he is going to, he has either done, he is doing, or he will do. We can say that without qualification that God is faithful. He's the faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Notice now, and some will try to make this passage to be a conditional uh, uh, passage, as if to say, if you keep his commandments, if you love him and keep his commandments to a thousand, uh, then he will be a faithful God to a thousand generations. That's not what that passage says. That um, that uh, passage does not have a conditional word such as therefore or if in it, does it? It is simply making a declaration that the God that is faithful will be faithful to us, will keep covenant and mercy with them that love him. That means he is going to be faithful to those who are in a state of love with him. Not that we'll love him, but that are in that state of love. We just sang a hymn. The hymn that said, we love him, why? Because he first loved us. This love that we have for our God, toward our God, is the direct product of the faith that he has put in us. So he's not saying here, if you love him and keep his commandments, he'll be faithful to you. Because we'll find some passages in a moment, in a moment that emphasize the fact that our Lord is faithful to us even when we're not faithful to him. Now, if you would turn with me to Psalm number 89. I'd like to spend a good bit of time here in Psalm number 89. Repeatedly in this psalm, the psalmist refers to our God as a God of faithfulness. We can count upon him. He begins this psalm by saying, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. That means perpetually I'm going to sing of his mercies. Now in this context, to sing of a thing is to rejoice in a thing. Do we rejoice in God's mercies toward us? We ought to. We ought to sing every day, rejoice every day in the mercies that our God shows to us. He says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever with my mouth. Now, I believe that he intends for us to sing out uh, to, to the glory, to the adoration, to the worship of our faithful God. He says, will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations? He said, I'm going to sing about your faithfulness. I'm going to sing about how reliable you are uh, to me and to all of you, uh, your children. He said, I'm going to sing it and I'm going to sing it uh, because you're faithful to me. We need to know that our God is a faithful God. We need to communicate to those around us that our God is a faithful God. Well, I just pointed out to you that in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses gives a list of the Ten Commandments. Also, in the next chapter, he tells us that we are to communicate those commandments to our children. Remember, when you rise up in the morning, when you sit in the house with them, or when you're in the way with him, or when you're laid out at night, you communicate the word of God. And what do we communicate? One of the missing elements, even in the greater uh, uh, Christian community, is the belief that God is faithful in every respect. Verse number two, he says, For I have said... Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall uh, shalt thou establish in the very heavens. Now think about that for a moment. How many times have you woke up in your life and the moon was gone? No moon, no more. It's forever gone. No stars. 
stars. You can never see stars. I'm not talking about cloudy nights. I'm talking about they just disappeared. What would it be like to wake up one morning and the sun not rise? Could you imagine waking up like that one morning? You know, come, usually I'm, I'm well awake this morning. I was awake about four o'clock and, and after a while, you know, getting around six o'clock, I could tell that the sun was rising because of the light coming through the window. Can you imagine what it would be like to wake one morning and the sun just didn't come up? Just no light. Well, we expect it. We live by the sun coming up. He's making the point, but the point here, he says, thy faithfulness uh, shalt thou establish in the very heavens. He says, the elements communicate thy faithfulness. Just like the sun comes up every morning. Our God is faithful. Just like the moon comes up on its cycle. Our God is faithful. Just like we see the beauty and the majesty of the stars. Night by night. Our God is faithful. They never cease. The Lord told, told Noah, you know, until the end of the world, you know, seed time and harvest, winter and spring and all those things. He said, that's not going to cease. Hot and cold, that's going to continue on. It's a testimony of the faithfulness of God. So when you rise in the morning and the sun is beginning to shine, you can pause and reflect upon the faithfulness of your God. Now, for the sake of time, skip on down to verse number five. He says, And the heaven shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. When the church meets, you can get, you can see the faithfulness of God upon those who meet. God has moved in your hearts. You're here this morning as a testimony of God's faithfulness. You know what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 16 about verse number 18? He says, upon this rock I build my church, and what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That means my church is going to continue, and here it is today. Well, look on down to verse number 8. He says, O Lord God of hosts, He says, who is a strong God like unto thee? He is ador adoring his God. He says, he says, you're the mighty God, the Lord of hosts, like the, the, like the king of a great and overwhelmingly powerful army. You're the God of hosts. You're almighty. You have all power. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong God like unto thee? He answers the question, uh, and, and inherent in the question is the answer. There is no strong God like our God. He's a faithful God, and he's almighty. He's omnipotent. He has all power. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere simultaneously. He's omnificent. He has everything that's created. He created it. Then he goes on to say, O Lord of hosts, who is a strong God like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Is there any other that's faithful like our God. There's none faithful like him. We want to be faithful to each other. I want to be faithful to you as a pastor. But I miss sometimes. But the God that we worship this morning, he never misses. He never misses an appointment. He never misses a need. He never misses a deed. He knows everything. And he responds accurately, perfectly, every time. He goes on to explain the faithfulness that's round about the Lord. He says, Thou rulest the raging of the sea. Now we need to know that, that our God who is faithful, that when the seas rage in our life, that he rules them. Sometimes we think that the seas are raging with such a fervor, that we're surely going to perish. But the God that we worship this morning has the power to say, peace be still, and there's perfect calm on the troubled seas of our life. In our lives, we have great troubles sometimes, either in health, financial problems, family problems, 
social problems, political problems, wars and rumors of wars. We have all these things, these troubles going on in our life. But the God that we trust in, he is faithful. He has power. He always has the power. He never loses power. I'm losing power. I am losing strength. I sure am. Yesterday, Brother Terry and I went and got our, uh, brought our deer stands out of the woods. And by the time we got them out, I was done. I couldn't wait to get home to sit down in my recliner because I was wiped out. I was done. My strength is not what it once was. But God never fails in his strength. He's never weakened. He's never lost memory. He has never gotten tired. He's never gotten weary because of the troubles of the way. The God that is faithful is always on scene with full strength and with full aptitude. He knows everything about everything. So when you kneel and pray, you're praying to a God that has all power and he's perfectly faithful. He goes on, he says, Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. So what does that mean to you and me? The Bible uses allegory, uses parable, example. So do we have any seas are raging in our life right now. Do we? Well, the God that that we worship this morning, he has power over those troubled seas in our lives. And you keep that in mind because we'll touch that in a moment. Again, in a moment, in a little different way. Now, what about the, the filth and the vulgarity and the sin that does so easily beset us? It seems that it's all around us. The next passage... Concerning this faithful God, he says, Thou hast broken Rahab, that is the harlot, referring to the filth and the vulgarity of this world. Thou hast broken a Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. God, you're faithful and you have power even over the most abominable sin. That's good to know, isn't it? Then he goes on, verse number 11. He says, the heavens, well, they're thine. The earth also is thine. Well, that's a sobering thought. I like sometimes to say, well, I'm going home to my house. To my house, my property. Well, it's not. It belongs to the Lord. He's just, he's just allowing us to enjoy it for a season. And you know, this is God's earth. He made it. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, there is an account of God's creation, God's act of creation. And I believe it's just like it's recorded. I don't believe it took a million years. I don't believe it took 6,000 years. I believe one day, that God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be this, let there be that, let there be the other, and it appeared on the scene immediately. Now, I've been called not very smart, not very intelligent, naive, but I believe that the God who is faithful spoke it into existence, just like the Bible records it. Now, he goes on. Now, not only is the earth his, as for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. That means everything that's in it belongs to him. Are we in the world? If we're in the world and everything in it belongs to him, who do we belong to? That's the reason we call him Lord. We call him Lord because he owns us. We belong to him. He has authority and power over us. Verse number 12, he says, The north and the south, thou hast created them. That encompasses everything. The north and the south. If he created the north and the south, the implication there is that everything between the north and the south, he made them. Now, go to verse number 19 for the sake of time. Then hast thou, then thou spakest in vision, uh, to the Holy One and saidest, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. 
I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I've laid help upon one that is mighty. He begins now to prophesy of the coming of Jesus Christ. He says, I have found David, who is a type of Christ, my servant with my holy oil, have I anointed him, verse number 21, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall be, uh, shall strengthen him, the enemy shall not exact upon him, mean the enemy, the adversary shall not control him, Verse number 23, and I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Speaking of the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. God the Father says you can count upon me being with your Messiah when he comes. You can count upon him having power and authority. You can count upon him uh, to go into this world and do my will. Now, in Psalm 143, in verse number one, the psalmist tells us that the faithfulness of our God is the object or the cause of our peace. He says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. He says, Lord, when I go to you, I have confidence that you're a faithful God. You've told me that you will hear me when I pray. So I'm counting upon you, my God, to hear me or when I pray. Do you remember... In Second Chronicles, when when, Mo, when Solomon had finished building the temple, he went into the temple and he knelt there and he began to speak to the Lord. He says, "He says, if your people, your people, which are called by your name, he says, if there's trouble in the land, if they'll come in here and humble themselves and seek your face." If they are praying here, will you hear from heaven and heal their land? Well, the Lord, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14, the Lord says, if my people, he answers him back. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. So let me ask you this morning, do you believe that God is faithful to his promise? You're called by his name. There was a body of believers in the city of Antioch They were first called what there? Christians. That means they were named after Christ. You're called by his name. You're children of God. You're his adopted. You belong to him. He has bought you with a price. So he says, if you, which are called by his name, shall humble yourselves. That means to come before his throne in a state of humility a contrite in heart and spirit, and pray. That means I petition or beg your father. That's what the word pray means, literally, to beg. To ask of him. We need these things, Lord. He says, if you'll seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. If there's ever been a time in this land that we as a people need forgiveness for our sins, it's right now. But the faithful God says, if we come before him, if we come before him, we humble ourselves and pray, he'll forgive us. And he'll bless this land again. Now, Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 3. Speaking in prophecy again of the coming of Jesus Christ. Isaiah says, Israel, incline your ear and come near unto me. 
year and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure. That means faithful. It's the same words that's translated faithful. Same word, same Hebrew word. Now let's read this again. Incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure mercies of David. That sounds like wonderful poetry, doesn't it? The sure mercies of David. You like that phrase? The sure mercies of David. David being a type of Christ. But what does it mean? The Apostle Paul was preaching at Antioch in Acts chapter 13, and verse number 34. He explains what Isaiah was talking about. He says, and as concerning uh, that he raised him up from the dead, God the Father raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. The sure mercies of David was that God would faithfully send his son who was typified by David. He would send his son to give his life. He would die. He would uh, be placed in the tomb. And the third day he would rise again. God, the father says, that is a sure thing. It happened. And Paul is writing in Acts chapter 13, just like uh, was prophesied in Isaiah 55, Paul says it happened just like that. You have received the sure mercies of David. So let me ask you this question this morning. Do you have the faith to believe that God the Father was faithful to send his son that you might enjoy the sure mercies of David? That he would send his son. That that son would willingly give his life for you? That he would pay your sin debt that you could not pay? Do you have the faith to believe that? If you do, it's because the faithful God has given you that faith. Now, Romans chapter 3. Turn there with me. Romans chapter 3, verse number 21. Paul writes, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. We being witnesses by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, I want to make sure that you're all with me, even the righteousness of God, which is by what? Faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. All right? So what he's saying, he says, even the righteousness of God is upon all them that believe and is because of the faith of Jesus Christ. That means the fidelity of Jesus Christ, that Christ is reliable. Jesus Christ says, I am the way and the what and the life, the way, the truth and the life. That means he's true. He perfectly kept the law of his father. He kept it. Perfectly, therefore, he came into this world, he suffered, bled, and died, and he made you righteous by his death. So what does that mean to you? We stand in the mirror in the morning, and we look at ourselves, let me make it personal. I stand in the mirror in the morning, and I say say to that image in the mirror, O wretched man that I am, I am unworthy of myself, of the mercies of our God. I'm unworthy of the sure mercies of David. What did I do to deserve, to deserve one to love me so much that he would not only give his life, but he would be made to be sin for me? What did I do to deserve that? The answer is nothing. The answer to the question is, that we're righteous because Jesus Christ died for us and made us righteous before God our Father. He was faithful to do that. He was true to his Father. He was true to you because it was promised to you that he would do that. And so now we look back some 2,000 years to Golgotha's Hill. That was a miserable day. That was an awful day. For God the Father, God the Son, the thieves that hung there, 
from Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, John, uh, the apostle John, that was at the foot of the cross with Mary. It was a miserable day. It was miserable for Peter, who was off weeping bitterly because he had denied his Lord. It was a miserable day. The Lord was suffering. The Son of God was suffering because of your sins. He was faithful to do that. Can you look back? Can you look back? And like Job said, I know that my Redeemer, who was once alive, and then he was dead. But now he liveth evermore. Can you say that I know that my Redeemer liveth? That though he gave his life for me, that he was faithful to his Father, he was faithful to his promise to me to give his life for me. He says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Notice that there is not a will in there. If your Bible has a will before the word believe, I want to see it when I'm done. We'll take care of that problem. This is a state of being because you have been given faith. We'll come to that subject on another day. You don't want to stay here all afternoon. He says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, how, who all does that include? Everybody. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace uh, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. My friends, we are made perfect before God the Father by one singular act. If I could make you perfect... I'd never sleep another week. I'd spend every day making people uh, perfect. If I could remove your sin, I would never sleep. I'd spend every waking woman removing people's sin. But there was only one who could, and he did. And it's called the sure mercies of David. Why is it called mercy? You know, words mean things, do they not? Does, do words mean things? Mr. Weston is a classroom teacher. Words mean things, do they not? When you speak words before the class, you expect the class to hear and understand and remember what you've taught them. God uses words for a reason. Mercy means something. Mercy is what you receive when you cannot do it for yourself. You go to the hospital, you're carried into the emergency room. You don't have a pulse. Somebody gets up on the gurney and begins to pump your chest to CPR. You know why? Because you can't do it yourself. You cannot sustain your life. You're dependent upon somebody to have mercy upon you that is due for you what you cannot do for yourself. So he's talking about the sure mercies of David. This faithful God has done for you what you could not do for you. He has washed your sins away. He has rendered you, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, uh, through the end of the chapter, He has made you white as snow and white as wool by the shed blood of His Son. All right. Let's keep on down to verse number 20, he say, 26. He says, To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works, name, but by the law of faith. This is the law of faith in that Jesus Christ was faithful to God the Father and to you. He has made you righteous by his singular action. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse number 9. Here again, Paul says, God is faithful. No, we need to write a song like that. God is faithful. We need to sing it. We need to think about it, that God is faithful. Listen to what he said here. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm called. You've heard of the doctrine of the effectual call, haven't you? Effectual call, it means that under his power, God the Father will surely call every one of his children to spiritual life. 
He will make you alive to know Him by His own action and not your own. So Paul says, God is faithful to do that. Alright, so if God is faithful to do that, is it possible that any child of God can die without being born again? Not at all. Every child of God between conception and death will be brought to spiritual life by the faithful God who will do it. Now, First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. <laughs> Have you ever heard the phrase that God will not put more on you than you can handle? Would you show me that in the scripture, please? You can't. That phrase implies that bad things always happen to you because God put it on you. But he knows what your limitations are. So he will not put more on you than you can handle. Please show me that in the scripture. Can I go back and use some Perry Florida grammar? It ain't there. Well, what is there? You know, I, for those of you who have used that phrase, I have to confess, in times past I've used that phrase too, so I, I don't want you to feel too mad about it. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. This is what the scripture actually says. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. Well, that's, a, you know, we always think that our problem is the worst problem of all. And nobody's ever had a problem as bad as mine. You ever think that? Well, I usually do when I'm in the midst of my problem. I have one of the, did you know that even preachers have pity parties? We try not to let anybody know, but we have them. I, I guarantee you. A preacher that says he never has a pity party. I'm not going to finish it. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is as common to man. That means when you have temptation troubles in life, everybody's having troubles. And when everybody's having troubles at the same time, God is not taxed one bit. He's not weakened. He's not hindered. If everybody's in the midst of the fire at all the same time, God can still handle. So he says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to a man. But God is what? Here's our word again. He's faithful. That means you can count upon him. I, 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 I want to be a pastor that you can count upon. I really do. I work hard at being a pastor that you can count upon. But you know, there's been times I would be out of town and somebody would go in the hospital and I'd be 600 miles away. And all I can say is I'm on the way home and I'm praying for you. But God is on scene. He is faithfully on the scene every time, all the time. <clears throat> he says, but God is faithful. Here it is now. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay, so what is it saying? When troubles come, don't blame God for the trouble. But when troubles do come, He's going to make sure that He provides a way of escape for you. That doesn't mean He's going to remove every trouble. That means He's going to make a way of escape. Some of the troubles that I have escaped from in my life, I escaped by going to the woods, hiding behind a tree and getting down on my knees and praying to my God and I thus escaped from the trouble. We escape from trouble by coming boldly before the throne of grace where we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Your God can be counted upon. He's faithful. That no matter how great the trouble is, he will provide a way of escape. Let me give you another illustration. When John the Baptist was in prison near the end of his life, he sent his disciples to the Lord to say, well, are you the one that we look for or should we go look for another one? The Lord told his disciples, you go shoot John again, these things. John was in distress 
John was cast down. John was in a low state. The temptation of life, the trial of life, had set upon him. You know, the Bible does not tell us how John responded when those disciples returned to him. I've related this a number of times before, but it, I need it right now, so I'm going to relate it again. When Elder J.T. Bush was nearing death, he always enjoyed hearing about church meetings and such things as that. So I stopped in one Tuesday to see him. And he was very weak. And I went in and I began to tell him about church meetings and such as that. His hand was very weak and very feeble and he put it over on mine. He says, J.C., just tell me about my Lord. I got the cue. Not the smartest guy around, but I figured that one out. And so I began to tell him about the great love wherewith our, our Lord loved us. How he came from heaven. He walked upon this earth. He endured the cruelness of man. He endured rebuke. He was shamed publicly. He was rebuked publicly. He was beaten. He was stoned. But he bore all of that. Went to the cross and gave his life. And rose again to justify us from our sins. That old man. Lay back upon his pillow. With a sweet smile upon his face. The next Sunday morning at 11 o'clock he died. The Lord provided a way of escape. From his misery, his distress, his anguish. He put his mind upon the great things of our God. Whatever your distress is. Your Lord is faithful to provide a way of escape. But let us never blame God for all the troubles that we have. Sometimes we have trouble simply because there's wickedness in this world. Sometimes we have troubles because we got our own self into trouble. Remember what the Lord told the children of Israel through Hosea? He says, O oh, Israel... Thou hast destroyed thyself. You did it to yourself. And oftentimes we do it to ourselves by our misbehavior. Do not, do we not? Oh, Israel, thou hast destroyed my, thyself. But that was not the end of that passage. He says, but in me is thine help. He says, you got yourself into trouble, but I still love you. I still care for you. I'm faithful to you. Now let's move on. Let's go to the Hebrew letter. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 17. With respect to the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, the apostle writes, he said, Wherefore in all things he, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation uh, for the sins of his people. A faithful high priest. All right. So we need to ask the question. Was Jesus Christ a faithful high priest? All right. Matthew 1 and 21 says, uh, The angel told Joseph concerning Jesus Christ that was to be born. For he shall save his people from their what? Sins. Jesus Christ, the faithful high priest on the cross, says it is finished. Did he do it? Now, did he make you savable? No. Did he condition you so that you could accept him and thus be saved? No. I firmly believe that Jesus Christ saved you by the single act of his death on the cross. All right. Now. Continue in the Hebrew letter, chapter 3, and verse number 2. Jesus Christ was faithful to his Father. Concerning Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Jesus was faithful to his Father. Well, what does that mean? Well, 
We're told that Jesus Christ came not to do His own. He says, I came not to do my own will, but the will of Him that has sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all which He hath given me, I should what? Lose nothing. So was Jesus Christ faithful to His Father that sent Him? Yes, He was. So can you say today that I know that my Redeemer liveth? Do you know that? I trust that you do. Because if you do, you're trusting in a faithful God. Now, Hebrews 10 and 23. He says again, he says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. All right, the profession of our faith. Our faith says this. Christ came into the world. He shed his blood. He paid our sin debt. And one day he's coming again. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that He will faithfully one day appear in the heavens and issue the command and all the dead in Christ shall rise and we'll be caught up together with Him in the air so shall we ever be with the Lord? Do you believe that? If you do, you're believing in a faithful God. Now, I want to close with Revelation chapter 19. Magnificent scene. Dramatic scene is unfolded here. Awful things are seen in this scene. But through the fog of the awful things, is as if John lifted up his eyes. And he says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called what? Faithful, Faithful and what? True. True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The God that you trust in, the Son of God, your Savior, His very name is faithful and true. He's called faithful. That means that no matter what comes. Now what about, what about your sins? Well, He died for my sins. What if you mess up this week? Are you on your own then? No. Jesus Christ said to God the Father, He says it's finished. They may mess up, but I still love them and my blood covers them. Now let me, let me just challenge your memory here. About this man that's called faithful. Was Adam faithful to God? No. Hmm. He wasn't. He disobeyed God. He sinned. But was God faithful to him? Even though he lost the benefit of the Garden of Eden, God was still faithful to him. He was ashamed of his nakedness. So God had prepared clothes from animal skins even after Adam had been unfaithful to God. God was faithful to Adam even when Adam was unfaithful to him. What about Israel? Was Israel always faithful to God? They murmured and complained at every turn. But God faithfully covenanted to them that He would give them the promised land. Did He do that? Why, certainly He did. Man's sin, sin in into the world and death by sin, for that all have sin. But God was faithful who promised to send His Son. And He sent His Son, who is our Savior. He's our Redeemer. He atoned for our sins. He promised to feed us as a flock. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He talks about... The Lord leading us beside the still waters. He prepares a table before us, before our enemies. Is He faithful to do that? Yes, He is. Is it possible that at some point our Father in heaven might cease to be faithful to us? No. No. Just like the sun rises every morning, as long as we live, our Father will be faithful to us. 
What about when the great troubles and trials of this life come? Can you depend upon your God? Will he make me? Will he give me a 20 year old body again? Forget it. It ain't going to happen. But will he make a way of escape? Will he bless me so that I can still enjoy the blessedness of my Lord and Savior? Let me give you a very present illustration. Two years ago, walk in Sister Gwen, see Sister Gwen, and she was convinced by the doctors that she'd never walk again. I was there when the doctor told her she would never walk again. She walked in here this morning. God made a way of escape. You know, you won't catch her jogging across town. But I assure you, the Lord has made a way of escape so that she can enjoy the blessedness of life. The Lord has given her a wonderful husband that stands along beside her. He has provided her a way of escape. Now the Lord has given her a children in home in our, uh, just right near her and a grandchild close by. Is God faithful to provide a way of escape? And then you might say, well, He ain't done that for me. But if you take stock and look, He's done something for you. We need to praise God for His faithfulnesses are in the heavens from the north to the south, it all belongs to Him. You belong to Him. And He hasn't forgotten you. Let us leave today rejoicing that we have a faithful God. May God bless you, my friend.